Amen. Amen. All right, here in Numbers chapter number 27, I want to draw your attention uh, beginning with verse number 12. Verse number 12, the Bible says this, And the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee up into this mountain of Iram, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. And when thou hast seen it, thou, thou also shalt be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother was gathered. <clears throat> Verse 14, For ye rebelled against my commandment in the desert of Zin, and the strife of the congregation to sanctify me at the water before their eyes. That is the water of Meribah in Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. Verse 15, And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. Verse 18. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. Verse 19. And set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. The title of my sermon comes from verse number 16, where the Bible says this, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, right here, set a man, set a man over the congregation. That's the title of the sermon this evening, Set a Man Over the Congregation. I'm going to be preaching on the subject of church leadership, church leadership, and specifically on the subject of a, the head of the church. Now, I want to begin in, the, in the, the very start by letting everyone know that the theme and the title of my sermon is taken directly from Scripture. It's taken directly from Scripture. It says this, set a man over the congregation. Now, this is a subject that many, many people are very, very confused about. There are two sides of this and I'm going to deal with this very quickly and then I'm not going to talk about that specific subject anymore until the very end there's a couple objections that I'm going to bring up. There's one side that believes that there, there needs to be just a panel of people. That there needs to be a panel of deacons, if you will, that are the decision makers. You have the pastor and he's supposed to preach to you. He, he, he prophesies or preaches the Word of God to you. But he's basically the figurehead to these people. He's not the ruler and he is not the bishop technically because that's what bishop means. It means overseer or ruler who really makes the decision. It's kind of like the, the conspiracy theorist in the United States of America, right? Which I, I, I believe this to be true to a degree. There's these people behind the scenes that are sitting back and they're making all the decisions, right? Well, that actually goes on in many Baptist churches today where the deacons are actually the decision makers and the pastor really has no authority at all. Now, that's obviously incorrect. And I'm going to be showing that that's incorrect, you know, uh, throughout this sermon. Um, and then also today, you know, there's a lot of people that would say, hey, well, I believe that the bishop is the ruler. The, you know, the bishop is the overseer, right? I believe that the bishop is the ruler and the overseer, but I believe that there needs to be numerous bishops in every church. There need, needs to be numerous rulers. There needs to be numerous overseers. Now, let me explain this to you, getting into what the, the Bible truly teaches, and I'm going I'm to demonstrate this very clearly through Scripture, that this is the ideal system of God's house. There are times when there needs to be numerous overseers. There are times when there needs to be numerous bishops or numerous rulers, and we're going to see this repeatedly. But in every case when God establishes a system whatever it may be, and he sets up an authority structure, there is always, listen to me, there is always a man that is over the congregation. There is always a top leader, if you will, or a head leader, or a chief leader in every situation. And I'm going to show that, that to you through Scripture, and it's going to be extremely clear by the, the time that I'm finished for this evening. Now, right here in Numbers chapter number 27, verse number, we'll begin in verse number 15, because I want to walk through this quickly and explain a few things of what's going on to you. Now, of course, Moses right now, he's about to die. Moses is about to pass away. And I want you to notice that this is Moses' understanding of what the children of Israel need. This is what they need. He says in verse 15, And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, watch this, set 
a man over the congregation. How many is that? That's one man. Set a man over the congregation. Look at verse 17. Which may go out before them and which may go in before them. And which may, look at this, lead them out. And which may bring them in. Now notice this is interesting. That the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. What does it sound like this leader is? You know another word for pastor? Shepherd. That's actually what the word sh uh, pastor means. It means shepherd. It's, it's synonymous. You can see that all throughout uh, the Bible. There are many examples of this. So it sounds like this guy's a what? Sounds like he's a pastor of the congregation. Or how about this? Sounds like he's the pastor of the church, doesn't it? Keep looking there. Look at verse number 18. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. So how many men are being ordained for this position? One. There is a man that is being set at the top of the congregation as the head or the leader of the church or of the congregation. It says this further, verse 19, And set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation and give him a charge in their sight. Now do we see this taking place in the New Testament? We see this almost identical. This is one thing that I want to hit home with you very, very hard throughout this sermon. Many people, when they have a lot of, uh, of misinterpretations and misunderstandings of, of the church in the New Testament, is because they think there's this major, huge disconnect. And there's all these major differences from the Old Testament to the New, to the New Testament. That is false. That is not true. There was a church in the Old Testament. I'm going to show you that. There was pastors at that time. There are a few differences. But by and large, the system is identical. And I'm going to show you that. So we see there... It says in verse number uh, uh, 20 now, look at verse 20. And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the, all the, congregation of the children of Israel, it says, may be obedient. Now, to who? To the shepherd, to the pastor. Who specifically? To Joshua. So what is he? They're being obedient unto him. What is he? He is the ruler. This, he is also what? The bishop. That's what the word bishop means. It means overseer or it means a ruler. So what is he? He is the bishop of the congregation. He is the shepherd. He is the pastor of the congregation. And notice that there is one man here that is the leader. Now, why is this so important? Well, number one, we see that Moses, we see that Moses, who is an extremely humble man, he's the meekest man upon all the earth, he is the leader of Israel for many, many, many years, isn't he? He, when he's passing away, he knows that it is crucial. Think about that. It is crucial or it is vital for the congregation or for the nation of Israel that they have what? That there be a man above the congregation. That there be a man over the congregation. They need to have a leader. And it is just as crucial today. This is why it's important for a sermon like this to be preached. Whatever authority structure that you, that you uh, uh, design up in your church of how many leaders and things that you have, because you can have multiple leaders. I'll tell you one thing that is very, very vital. It is extremely important, and that is that there is a man that is set at the top of that. There is a man that is over the congregation, that is the ultimate decision maker. And if you don't have a leader or a man over the congregation, your congregation will fail. Your congregation will fail. I want you to go with me to Numbers chapter number 11. Most of these passages, I actually had set them up when I was structuring my sermon where, where I wasn't going to have you turn to all of them, but I'm going to change that. We're going to be doing a lot of turning. I want you to see all of these verses. I want you to go to Numbers 11. Numbers chapter number 11. Now, why did Moses think that it was so crucial? Because that was actually the system that God designed for Moses. This is, and I'm going to show you, the ideal system that God sets up. That's why Moses is coming to the Lord and saying this. Because God is the one that designed an authority structure where a man is set over the congregation. I want you to look in Numbers chapter number 11, verse number uh, 9. We're going to read in Numbers chapter number 11, verse number 9. It says this, And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. Verse 10, Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? So I, I just want to ask you a question. What type of system or structure was set up at this time with Moses? 
The, he says that the burden of all this people, all this people was upon who? Was upon him. What was going on? He was the leader. He was the man that was set over the congregation or over the nation of Israel. What was going on with Joshua? Joshua, <clears throat> excuse me, was replacing Moses. Do you know what that, that means? Moses, when he was there, he was the man that was set over the congregation. And there's one man that's taking his place, and what is he going to be? This is very important. He, the, a man that is set over the congregation. Set a man over the congregation, Moses said. I'm leaving. There needs to be another man that can be their shepherd. There needs to be another man that they can be obedient to that will be their ruler, or their overseer, their bishop. Right? So keep reading there. Look at verse number 12. Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them that thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? Verse 13. When should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. That's interesting because who's feeding them here? In a sense, right? What's he saying? Do I have flesh to give all this people? He's the pastor. He's the shepherd, right? <clears throat> Obviously, it's, it's ultimately coming from, from the Lord, right? And, and, and here's the thing. Let me clarify this before I go any further. Of course, Jesus is the chief shepherd. Right. He is the chief shepherd. He's, he's the, the head of the, at the very, very top. But he has ordained that there be leaders below. Correct, right? Look here at verse number uh, 13. When, uh, when should I... Look, skip verse four, uh, 13. We read that. Look at verse 14. I am not able to bear all this people alone. And then he says, because it is too heavy for me. Again, what was the system that was designed? He says, alone. Alone. That's important to understand. This is the system that God set up. And who was the leader of all of it? Moses. One man. That's why Moses said Joshua was replacing him. Set a man over the congregation. Keep reading. Further proof of this. You keep reading. And, and if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of, out of hand. If I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. Now notice at this point, God, God at, this, at this moment understands, you know, that, that uh, of course he understands, but I have to use that language. He, he understands and he knows that Moses is displeased. Moses is, is grieved about what's going on. So what does he do? He, he basically does this to pacify Moses, doesn't he? So was Moses correct when he was saying that he was set up above the children of Israel? Yes, he was. Yes, he was. And he said, you know what? Since you're above the children of Israel, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 70 elders. Bring those 70 elders over, and I want you to ordain these 70 elders. So what's going to be going on now? Now he's not bearing it what? Necessarily. Alone, is he? But let me ask you this question. By the time that Joshua takes over, because some people get the idea in their mind, well, now there's, now there's, there's 71 elders that are all just, just equal, right? They're all just you know, equivalent. What does Moses say about Joshua? What does he say? This is after that, my friend. This is when Moses is dying and he's leaving. What does he say? You need to set a man over the congregation to replace Moses. So was Moses still over these men? Yes, he was, my friend. Yes, he was. He was still above and he was still over these men as far as authority goes. Moses was at the top and now what's going on? There, there are going to be other elders that he is going to be overseeing. And this is how authority structures work everywhere. In every situation, it doesn't matter whether it's the military, right? Is how it works. Somebody always has a boss that they answer to. Hey, there are a lot of bosses in the military, aren't there? But they have another boss that they answer to. Right, Brother Hall? Any, any company, is this different than any company you've ever worked at? Hey, how many, how many uh, 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 field supervisors are there, Brother Rick, at your company? Three. Three field supervisors. Do they have a boss? Yeah. Are they equal with him? No, no. He's the head over top of them, but then there are three field supervisors. So that's basically what's going on here. You have three, you have the field supervisors. You have the 70 elders that are out in the field, right? They're doing some of the work to try, try to relieve the project manager's job, if you will, right? In my situation, I'm an on-site supervisor, basically. That's what I do. But guess what? I have a PM. I have a project manager that I answer to myself. And you know what? There are other on-site supervisors, too. We're like the 70 elders. But guess what? We have a boss. We have a boss, and he's over all of us. So did the children of Israel. So did the 70 elders. 
So when we see Moses ordaining or appointing Joshua, what does he say? Set a man over the congregation. So who is this, where is this man going to be? He's going to be over the congregation. He's going to be over the 70 elders, isn't he? So notice that there's an authority structure here. This is very important to understand. But there still is a man that is set over the congregation. There's a man that is at the top of this line. I want you to go to uh, uh, Acts chapter number 13. Acts chapter number 13, then we'll be coming back to the Old Testament. <clears throat> Acts chapter number 13. Now, this is the case from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Now, I'm going to be giving you a quick overview, and then we're going to be looking at this even further uh, in detail. But we get a little bit of, of this, of an idea of this here in the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 13, verse number 16. It's very interesting. Look at verse number 16. It says this. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. The God of this people, the God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an high arm brought he them out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven, uh, seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that he gave unto them judges about the space of four hundred years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul the son of Kis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space, space of forty years. Verse 22, And when he had removed him... He raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave, te gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. So if we go back to the beginning of when God began to deal with the nation of Israel, who's the very first person that he, that he raises up? You know, at the very start, even before it's technically Israel, it would be Abraham. Notice that he had a man. That man was a leader. He was the leader of his household. He was the boss. He was a patriarch, right? Then he dealt with another single individual man. A man, and who was it? It was Isaac. Then he dealt with another man. A man, and who was it? It was Jacob. Then, technically, he dealt with another man. Just one. And who was it? Joseph. He, these are men that he would raise up, just like the wording that he uses here. He raises up this man. You know why? That is, that is uh, 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 pointing out specifically that he chooses or anoints or appoints this particular man, a man that he's going to use. You can follow this line all throughout that time. Not only that, after, uh, uh, what was the last one that I mentioned just now? It would be Joseph. So not only that, when they're leaving Egypt, what happens? He goes to Moses and he handpicks Moses. And Moses is the one that says to him, I'm not an eloquent man. I don't want to go by myself. And it, and it actually angers God, doesn't it? And he says, fine, get Aaron and he'll go with you. And you know what else he says? You'll be to him a God and he'll be to you a prophet. So guess who was the top there too, buddy? Moses and then Aaron. Because you know why? God had handpicked Moses to be the man that was set over the congregation. So you notice this pattern going all throughout this. I'm going to demonstrate this with the judges in just a moment, but it's the same way with the judges. He individually raised up a judge, a man at each time. I'm going to demonstrate this very clearly from Scripture. There's no question about it. A judge for the space of 400 years. Each time there was a man or a judge that, that, that uh, rose up, that God raised up, he chose to use this man. You know, God's Spirit was upon him. And then that man would die, <clears throat> they would go back into sin, and then God would raise up another man, another leader that would be over the congregation. He would be a judge, he would be a deliverer. As we saw, he's a shepherd, he's a bishop, isn't he? Not only that, then we get to where? We get to the kings. What type of system is that? This is just a quick overview of what we're going to look at. It's a system where there's a man over the congregation. What happened with Saul? God chose Saul. God picked Saul. Amen. Amen. I believe it even uses that wording. Let's look there one more time. Look at what it says in uh, verse number 13. And after they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Kiss. Look at this. A man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of 40 years. Notice that, that saying over and over again. Set a man over the congregation. Right here we say a man of the tribe of Benjamin. Right? It's one man. Look at verse 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them. Look at this. David to be their king. What did he do? He raised up a man. He raised up a man to be over the congregation. Look what it says down further. I have found David, the son of Jesse. Look at this. A man 
after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Notice that he raises up a man each time. It's extremely consistent. Go back to Exodus chapter number 18. We'll see this further with Moses. When he has rulers underneath of him, he is still the boss. They, yes, they're rulers. It's been distributed out, but he, they answer to him. They answered to him, just like it talks about the heads of the tribe of Israel. Well, he was the head of Israel. He was the top boss. Of course, the head of that is Christ. Of course. No one, don't try to create a straw man, you know, because people will try to do that. The head, according to the, the analogy that's given in the New Testament of the body of the church, is Christ, of course. At, no one disagrees with that. But the Bible's very clear that there are rulers, right? And there was the rulers of the nation of Israel. And God, or Christ, was the head of the nation of Israel as well. But guess what? He said a man over the congregation. So it still makes perfect sense. I want you to look here in Exodus chapter number 18, and we'll see this again. Look at verse number 14. Verse 13, let's start there. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest, doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone? And all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening, even. And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform this, to perform it, thyself alone. Now I want to point out to you, number one, that this is not necessary, this is not, not at all. Uh, the word of God that's coming to him, right? This is, of course, his father-in-law. So we're going to take that with a grain of salt. But we did see where Moses was. He was basically breaking down. And he was saying the exact same thing in a moment of, of, of extreme stress because the people were burdensome to him. And he said, just like his father-in-law said, it's too heavy for you, right? Moses felt like at some times that it, would, it was too burdensome, right? To have to lead the entire nation as a man that was set over the congregation, right? So notice what his father-in-law suggests here. <clears throat> Verse 19, Hearken now unto my voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work uh, they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them, watch this, to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. <clears throat> and let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee. But every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing and, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure... <clears throat> And all this people shall also go to their place in peace. And it says, So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. And Moses chose able men of all Israel, watch this, and made them heads over the people. So are these rulers? Yes, they are rulers, aren't they? These are rulers, heads over the people. Rulers, it even says right after that. Rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And they judged the people at all seasons. Now watch this. The hard causes they brought unto Moses, but every small matter <clears throat> they judged themselves. Now he told him to take it to God, and if God was all right with this, then to do that. Right? So this was his father-in-law's idea. He came up with this idea. Now I don't think that it's bad advice. I don't think that this is bad advice. This is actually a system that God sets up the next time when Moses goes to him and says pretty much the same thing. Hey, I need help. What does he say? Take 70 elders. And what does he do? He does basically the exact same thing. He sets up these rulers or these, these, these elders that are under him. And what happens? If they have a hard matter, what would they do? Of course, they would bring it to Moses. That's what they would do. Moses was the man that was set over the congregation. He was the leader. But guess what? There were other rulers, weren't there? There were other rulers. Now, there's no problem with having multiple rulers at a church. But there has to be a Moses. There's no problem with having multiple rulers. There's no issue with that. If, if, if it gets to the point where one man cannot bear the burden and it's too heavy for him, then get other rulers. 
but there has to be a ruler at the top. There has to be a Joshua. There has to be somewhere where you go and say, hey, this is the final say right here. This works this way no matter where you want to go out into the world in, 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 in uh, you know, any kind of, of secular system. They even understand this logically. The Bible teaches it, God sets it up, but even the world sets this up. There has to be somewhere where the buck stops. There has to be a point to where, hey, we don't know what to do because here's the thing. If everyone is all equal, you have five people. Do you know what you have? You have a mess uh, w when there's a disagreement. But when those five people, they don't know what, the, you know what to pass as far as judgment, what do they do? Then they go to their head. And you know what Moses says? This is what you should do. You have a matter that's too hard for you. you you're disagreeing amongst yourselves and you're not able to find an answer. Bring it to me and I'll give you an answer. That's the purpose of the bishop. That's the purpose of the ruler. That's the purpose of the shepherd. That's the purpose of the judge. The man that was set over the congregation, which was Moses, that was his job. Yes, there was rulers over 50s, 10s, 5s. There were rulers. There's this system that's set up, isn't there? That's why he says 50s, 10s, 5s. It just goes all the way down. There's a system that's set up, but there's all. But you're climbing the ladder here. Then there, the, 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 buck, the buck stops somewhere, and it doesn't stop with a group of people. It doesn't stop with a, with a trinity up top, right? It stops with one man. One person, right? It stops with one man. A man. He set a man over the congregation. This was God's will, keep in mind. This was God who set Moses as a man over the congregation. And when Moses went to pass the torch, he didn't pass it to five people. He knew what God had. And what did he do? He said, set a man over the congregation. You know what God said? You're right. I'll do it. Take Joshua. He's a perfect uh, substitute for you. Take Joshua. Joshua and give him some of your honor so the people can be obedient unto him. What did that mean? He was the ruler. He was the shepherd. Do you know what will happen if you don't have a man at the top? They'll be, that, this is just the truth. This is why I said it will fail. They'll be as sheep that have no shepherd. They'll just be a bunch of, a bunch of sheep, basically, that are trying to make decisions for themselves. That's ultimately what you'll end up having. having. I want you to go now with me, go to Numbers chapter number 30. Numbers chapter number 30. So notice there's rankings. But guess what? Moses was the one that, that was the executive, right? He would veto things. He was the head. Numbers chapter number 30. I want you to notice that this is actually the system like I just mentioned to you a moment ago that God had Moses set up. This is where we're actually going to see this take place. You know, we saw Ruel or Jethro, if you will. Go to Moses and present this idea to him, his father-in-law. And then God, of course, was going to do this in the first place. And then we see God doing this here. These, this is all uh, planned by God. The words here, uh, uh, when Moses is speaking of the people, these are commandments from God. Look at verse 1, chapter number 30 of the book of Numbers, verse number 1. And Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. So I want you to notice that there are heads of the tribes of the children of Israel. Now I want you to turn with me to Numbers chapter number 3 verse number 32. Numbers chapter number 3 verse number 32. So I'm going to point out a few things as we go here. We saw Moses was a man that was set over the congregation. We saw that Joshua replaced him. It was a man that was set over the congregation. We saw that there were rulers that were ruling concurrently or with him, a part of the same system, but he was the head or he was the man that was set over that congregation. Not only that, we saw there that uh, uh, in the passage before that there were 50s, there were fives, there were multiple different groups of the rulers. And there were 70 elders that he even ended up setting up. But there was still a man over the congregation, wasn't there? This was God's will. God was the one that designed this system. We're going to see here that even the priest, God's house, now this is extremely important. God's house was designed the exact same way. The, the temple and the Levites, it was set up the exact same way. Look at Numbers chapter number 3, verse number 32. This is God telling us how leadership is supposed to be. This is God telling us, hey, this is my house. This is the Lord's house. Hey, spiritual, spiritual doings, this is how things should be set up. Look at Numbers chapter number 3, verse number 32. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, shall be, watch this, chief over the chief of the Levites and have the oversight of them that keep 
the sanctuary. So I want you to notice that, that there are rulers even within the system of the Levites, isn't there? The Levites is the entire tribe. Now they're all broken into all these different groups, of course. And it goes through all of them, uh, Mirai, and then you have the Kohathites and all of them. There's tons of them, right? But there's also one... So there's chiefs of each of those. Let me say that first. Because they have different jobs. The Kothites were the singers. They did the music, right? So they had different jobs. So guess what there was? There was a chief singer. A chief musician he's actually referred to as, right? But do you know who Eleazar was? You know what his title was? He's the chief over the chief of the Levites. You know what his job is? He's the head of the heads. He's the ruler of the rulers. He's the man that's set, in this case, over this congregation, isn't he? Now... And the system that's designed, of course, uh, those that were of the Levites, they were ruled over by Moses, even. Moses was at the top of them. So you see this ladder, like I said, that's all these different systems that God has working concurrently, but then there's a man that's set over the congregation, isn't there? So we can see this over and over again, that multiple rulers can be ruling at the same time, but there's always a man that's set over the congregation. In the temple, there are chiefs there. There's chiefs over the musicians. There's chiefs over those that did the incense. There were people that carried the ark, right? And they had a chief over them. They had a boss. They're field supervisors, right? But you know what they have? A project manager. And you know who that, actually in that case in the temple, you know what he's got? He's got also a project manager. Maybe you want to call him a branch manager, right? And then if you go further, you have the owner who's God, right? So you see this system that's climbing, but here's the point. In the, in the, in the human system of the church or the congregation, God has someone at the top. There's a man that's set over the top. Now I want you to notice even within the temple. Let's look at spiritual things. Let's just eliminate it and look at God's house. What is there? Is there five people that are over the chiefs? There's one man. Think about that. Let that set into your mind. This is God ordaining this system. He doesn't set up ten people that are aboard. That is important to understand. When God says, hey, let me give you an ideal system of how God's house is going to operate, I want to set a man, a chief over the chiefs. Not chiefs over the chiefs, not five over these five other supervisors. No, I want, a, I want one man. Because the buck always has to stop with one man. There always has to be a man that's set over the congregation. This is consistent all throughout the Bible. This is how, when God always wants to do something, He always raises up a man. When God sets up a system, a spiritual system, or even a physical kingdom, there's always a man that's set over that system. Every time, every single time. And if there's not, there'll be a sheep have, not having a shepherd. That's what'll happen. Go to Judges chapter number 2. I'm going to show you that the judges' system was very clearly, without a shadow of a doubt, one judge at a time. That was how God designed the system. <clears throat> so this is immediately following Joshua. We have actually Joshua. Really, If you want to be very, very technical, Moses was a judge. Moses was a judge. Uh, uh, after Moses was Joshua. That's why you begin here in Judges chapter number 1, verse number 1. Now after the de death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? What's going on? <clears throat> they don't have a leader. <clears throat> they don't have a judge. That's why the book of Judges begins just like this. <clears throat> I want you to skip down with me. Go to, as I said, Judges chapter number 2. Let's look at verse number 18. Judges chapter number 2. Look at verse number 18. <clears throat> it says in verse number 18, And when the Lord raised them up judges, and some people say, Oh, see, there's judges all at the same time. Pay, pay close attention. Then the Lord was with the judge. So he's, he's talking about the system in general. When the, at the time when the Lord raised up judges, for those 400 years when the Lord raised up judges, he says, Then... The Lord was with the judge. So do you notice how many judges are ruling at the same time? One judge. One judge. Keep reading. The judge, and watch this, and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of, watch this, the judge. It's one man over the congregation. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. Back up to verse number 6. I want you to notice what happens here because when they don't have a judge, when Joshua died, they do exactly what Moses was fearful of. Moses was scared of. Hey, there was a lot of other rulers. There was still the chief of the chief of the Levites, wasn't there? There was a lot of there was the other elders, other rulers, but they didn't have a man that was over the congregation. As I said, look at verse 6 here in Judges chapter number 2. 
And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord, watch this, all the days of Joshua. And all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being an hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Erez, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gaash. So notice what's it implying. What's, what's it trying to emphasize? The death of Joshua, when Joshua was gone. Look at verse 10. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. Watch this. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods, of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. What happened? They were as sheep, not having a shepherd. That's exactly what took place. Look at the next verse, verse 14. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and He delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and He sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. As the, as the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Now watch this. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. Now watch very carefully like we read before. We'll see that it's one judge. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. So notice very clearly this is an individual or singular judge at, at a time. And he speaks of in general during the time when God raises up these judges. That's how he's wording it. When God raises up these judges then they'll be obedient to the Lord. And God is with the judge. Further proof of that is if you keep reading, look at verse 19. I, mean, I believe it's right here. Yeah, look at verse 19. It came to pass when the judge was dead. Notice that. What is that? That's one judge. That's the man that set over the congregation. What does that sound like? Who was set over the congregation? Who was that specifically set about? Joshua. What happened? When he died, what happened? They went and they corrupted themselves. Look at verse 19. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. So what is the judge? It's that line of rulers that God designated and God set up. And guess what it is? It's a man that's set over the congregation. Look at Judges chapter number 3. It's the, it's the judge is the pastor, right? He's the, he was the shepherd of the congregation. Uh, Moses clearly said that he didn't want them to be as sheep not having a shepherd. So what was Joshua? He was their shepherd. He wanted them to be obedient unto him. That they might be obedient unto him like they were unto Moses. What does that mean? He's the ruler. What does that mean? He's the bishop. Look here in Judges chapter number 3. <clears throat> Look at verse number 9. Look at verse number 8. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Shushan Rishatham, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Shushan Rishatham eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, watch this, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. Look at verse 10. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war, and the Lord delivered Shushan Rishatham to, uh, I'm sorry, Shushan Rishatham, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed against Shushan Rishatham. What happened? He raised up a deliverer. What is a deliverer? It's a judge. They're used interchangeable. He judged Israel. He was a deliverer. What is it? It's this line that went on. After Joshua, he died. And then it goes into speaking about the judges. That when, during the time of the judges, while they're ruling, hey, they're obedient. But when there's not a judge ruling, what happens? When he dies, when he, a man, the man that's set over the congregation dies, they go and they're as sheep, not having a shepherd. So notice the system that God has set up. Isn't this important? We can see into God's mind. What type of authority structure did God desire for Israel? Let me ask you that question. What type of authority structure did God desire for Israel? He said, I want a man to be over the congregation. 
set a man over the congregation. It made him angry when he wanted Aaron to come with him. He said, okay, hey, let me, let me explain something, what's going on here. You be to him a god and he'll be to you a prophet. You're the, you're the boss. That's what he's saying. That's his point. You think of a lord rides a boss. That's what he's saying. <clears throat> what goes on when, when the children of Israel is brought out of Egypt? They're in the wilderness. Moses is the boss. Moses is the ruler. And he stays that way. And he is a man that's set over the congregation. When he's about to die, what does he say? Lord set a man over the congregation. Just like you did before with me. They need a man over the congregation. I'm about to die. I'm about to leave. And I don't want them to be as sheep not having a shepherd. Set a man over the congregation. And God said, you're right. Let's do Joshua. You know what happened? They set a man over the congregation. A man. What happened with the judges? A man. A judge. He raised up a, he didn't raise up a panel of judges. He didn't raise up multiple judges. That's important to understand. This is the system. We all understand this, right? God did not want them to even have a king. You say, oh, you're trying to have a king. You're trying to have a king in your church. No, we're trying to have a judge. That's what we're trying to have, buddy. You're trying to be a king. You're trying to reign over you know, God's sheep. No, I'm, I'm trying to be the shepherd. So, there's not the sh so the sheep aren't as sheep that don't have a shepherd and they're scattered. That's what I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be a Moses. I'm trying to be a Joshua. That's what I'm trying to be. I'm trying to fill that gap where there needs to be a man that is set over the congregation. That's God's ideal plan, my friend. Amen. God's ideal plan wasn't for a king. I agree with you. That's the truth. The, God did not desire for there to be a system with a king. You know what he wanted? He wanted a judge where the people were still obedient to him. He's the, he's the bishop. He's the overseer. He's the ruler of the congregation. Right? And not only that, he's the shepherd. You think that's a coincidence? Not even slightly. So what is he? He's the pastor. What is he? He's the bishop. That's what bishop means. You study it out. It means overseer or it means ruler. That is what a bishop is. You know what he is? He's the pastor. He's the bishop. And he is the man that's set over the congregation. Amen. Hey, this church is going to grow. You know what's going to happen? We're going to need other rulers. And I'm going to set up other rulers. Right? And I'm going to counsel with people about who they think and, and talk to them and things like that. But I'll be the one to ordain them. And you know what will happen? They'll come when they have a hard matter to me. Amen. And the buck will stop with me. In this particular congregation, in this church, I'm the man that's set over this congregation. Amen. That's the system that God designed for His congregation or for His church. That's His ideal system. That is the authority structure that God desires. Think about that. That is what God desires as an authority structure. Let's look at the kings even. Because, hey, yeah, He agreed with them. Hey, we want a king, we want a king. God said, okay, I'll give you a king. But God still set up a system that He was pleasing with. And he still set up men that he was happy with. You know what he did? He gave them a king. And you know what he did? He raised up a man. It's very similar to the judges. Obviously, the king had more authority than he wanted him to have. But even the judge, they were obedient to him. Look at how Moses ruled. Moses was much more harsh and ruled with a stronger arm than I do here, right? They were, of course, a part of a nation. Right? The king had more authority than God wanted him to have. The king had even more authority of the nation, over the nation than the judges did. Right? Well, guess what? They wanted a king. He gave them a king. And you know what he did? He raised up a man each time. Same system. Very similar to the same system. Same type of... Uh, uh, not as far as authority system. That's not what I meant. But same pattern. Let's use that word. Same pattern. You know what he did? They're not a judge anymore. You wanted a king that's going to be a monarch now at this point. I'll raise you up a king. He chose a man. Chose a man. Each time. You know what he did? He picked a man. But you see this pattern all throughout the Bible where God seeks a man. God likes to deal with a man. You see this all throughout the Bible. Even in the book of Ezekiel. He sought for a man to stand in the gap and to make up the hedge and he found none. He looks for a man. He goes to Samuel. Samuel was the last judge. I need a man. That's what he's doing. He's going to Samuel because he needs a man. You know what he, he needs? He needs a man to be the ruler. When you, you say, man, you know, you're, you, you rule like a king. Samuel, when Samuel went around the town, do you know what happened? People were afraid when Samuel came to town, the Bible says. When, ta when Samuel went on his circuits and he came to the city, people were scared. I don't see anybody in here that's scared when I walk in the door. Like, oh, it's Pastor Baker. 
I don't see people here doing that. So, so don't try to refer to me as a king or try to say, oh, you're, you're trying to rule like a monarch. No, I'm trying to rule like a judge. That's what I'm trying to rule like. I'm trying to rule like how the Bible set up the system from the very beginning. There needs to be a judge. There needs to be a Moses. There needs to be a Joshua. There needs to be a pastor or a bishop. There needs to be a man that's set up to rule. Amen. And if you don't have a man, your church will fail. Hear, hear me very clearly. Your church will, without a doubt, I'm not telling you maybe, I'm telling you, what's your authority? The Word of God. What's your authority? Moses. Moses thinks your church will fail if you don't have a pastor. And if you don't have a ruler, if you don't have, let me word that this way for you, my friend. If you don't have a man set over the congregation, the people will be as sheep not having a shepherd. That's what the Bible says. That's what Moses says. Amen. So you know what you need? You need a shepherd. You need a pastor. You need a bishop. That's what you need. You need a man that's set over the congregation. Hey, have rulers. I want many bishops. I want many elders. Have them. Have them. But you better set a man over the congregation. That's the system God desires. That's the ideal system. Hey, I don't need other laws, right? We look at the word of the Lord. We look at the, the, the commandments. They're perfect. Amen. I don't think we need to change them. I don't think we need any, any other laws. Well, guess what? I don't think we need a different authority structure. I don't need you to brainstorm how we can rectify, you know, what modern day, you know, uh, uh, church structure is with the Bible. I want what the Bible's church structure is. I want what the Lord's original or initial church structure and authority structure was that he set up. And you know what he wanted? He wants a man to be over the congregation. That's important. That's extremely important. There needs to be a strong leader. If there's not a strong leader that's making decisions, the church is going to fail. It's just, that's just what's going to happen. That You can see this over and over again. You say, prove it. Look at the nation of Israel all throughout the book of Judges. What happens every time? The judge died. They go downhill morally. Every single time they stop serving the Lord. Why? What is it telling you? They have become as sheep not having a shepherd. The man that was set over the congregation is gone and now they're scattered. It's just, it's just the way the Bible teaches it. If you've got a problem with it, you don't believe the Bible. You, 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 you struggle with that particular concept of what the Bible teaches. That's what's going on there. It's, it's extremely clear. If there's not a man set over the congregation, the, the, the church will fail. They will go a whoring after Ashtoreth. They'll go a whoring after Balaam. That's what will happen. Because there has to be a, a ruler. There has to be a man that is keeping things in line. That is saying, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're not going to do. Hey, have other rulers. But there has to be someone where the buck stops. That's what the Bible teaches. See this further. Let's go, let's go now look to Acts chapter number 7. This is a concept I want you to understand. It's, it's extremely important. Acts chapter number 7. The church did not begin in the New Testament. This is such a weird teaching. It's, it's dispensationalism. And even people that reject dispensationalism, they can't get this out of their mind. The church did not begin in the New Testament, my friend. The system of the church it has existed. We, the word bishop may feel odd to you. It may feel like it's new in the New Testament, but it is not. The word bishop just means ruler. That's all that it means. It means overseer. It means boss. It means ruler. It's just another word for what Joshua did. It's just that it's, it's all that it is. It's another word for what Moses did. He was the ruler. That is what bishop means. What else was he? He was the pastor. There was a man that was set over the congregation and there was the church. I'll, show, I'll prove it to you that the church was in the Old Testament. Look at Acts chapter number 7, verse number 37. It says this in Acts chapter number 7, verse number 37. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God... <clears throat> Raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers and so forth and so forth. And notice what it said in verse 38 in the very beginning. This is he, talking about Moses, that was in the what? Church in the wilderness. You know what was in the Old Testament? You know what was in the, in the wilderness? The church. The church. You know what it was? It was the congregation. The word church means congregation. The congregation was there. And guess what there was? There was an overseer. There was a bishop. What does that mean? What does bishop mean? It's just another word for ruler. Who was the ruler? Moses. Now, do you think that it's a coincidence when he goes to have a man replace him? He says, hey, I don't want them to be as sheep not having a shepherd. What was he? What is he calling himself? What is Moses saying that he was to the church? Shepherd. What's another word for shepherd? Pastor. There's no difference. This is where people really struggle. There's not a difference. Get the dispensationalism out of your mind. Even people that, that, that know that they reject it, they struggle with things like this. 
There isn't a difference. There was a church there. And there was a bishop there. There was an overseer there. Like the Bible says, hey, obey them that have the rule over you. Who are they talking about? Everyone knows. Talk about the bishops. Talk about the pastors. What does it say that they're going to be to Joshua? He says, put, take some of your honor and put it on him that the people may be obedient unto them. You know what he was? He was a ruler. The same kind of ruler that he's talking about in Hebrews. It's the church. It's the congregation. It's the pastor. It's the bishop. The church did not begin in the New Testament. The church didn't begin in the book of Acts. The transitional book of Acts. No. The church is in the Old Testament. The congregation is in the Old Testament. The church existed then and there was a man that was set over the what? Over the congregation. You know what that means? There was a man that was set over the church. That's what that means. There's not a difference, my friend. Not only that, let's go over... Like I said, I'm going to have you turned all these. I was going to read them. Go to Matthew 16. <clears throat> go to Matthew chapter number 16. Notice this unbroken chain here. Matthew chapter number 16. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 16, verse number 18. <clears throat> this is Jesus speaking to His disciples. He says this, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Flip over to chapter number 18. Chapter number 18. Look at verse number 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Verse 17, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. Tell it unto the what? It's the congregation, the church. What existed at this time? The church. The church existed. The congregation existed. Are they, are they like, what in the world is the church? What is the congregation? Jesus? No, it existed already. It never ended. It, it was there all along. God talks about the shepherds all throughout the book of Jeremiah. He talk, in, in Ezekiel, he talks about the bad shepherds, doesn't he? The church was always there. And God set up a system where there was a man that was supposed to be. Hey, they may, might not have done that for many years, but the, God had his system with the church, with the congregation. And he wanted a man over the congregation. Set a man over the congregation. They knew exactly what he was talking about. Hey, if they neglect to hear thee, take it to, take it to the church. Go to the church with it. What's he saying? Go to the congregation. The church didn't begin in the book of Acts. The church existed. You know, really, if you want to be very, very technical, that's around the time when what we would think of as a, a really an organized, structured system. Now, people gathered before this, and I'm sure there was pastors and elders before this, but really when God, when we, from reading the Bible, when it feels like God put it, puts His hand in there and He starts to develop a, a really organized, structured system, it's with them in the wilderness. Now, there may have been, I'm sure there was times before this, maybe God, a lot of things, you know, every word that Jesus spoke isn't even recorded. So we don't know how God dealt with people outside of what we have in Scripture, right? But really clearly we can see in, uh, the, in the wilderness, God clearly has a church there. In a congregation, He has a man set over it, doesn't He? It continued on. The church was in the wilderness. The congregation was in the wilderness. And what was, what was Moses? He was a prophet. That's what it calls him right there. He was a ruler. He was a pastor. I want to pound this into your head. This is very, very important. Go with me to 2 Peter. <clears throat> Let me ask you this question. At the time, the New Testament there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the time of that, who was the pastor at that time of, of, of the church? Who was the pastor? <clears throat> who would have been the shepherd? Jesus would have been the shepherd. What was the system like when Jesus was on the earth? Was there a panel? Was it the twelve apostles and then and then and they would all kind of talk amongst each other? You know, was there this panel that was set up where you know the twelve apostles and Jesus kind of they sat down and they conferred with one another? They had a conference and they're conferring with one another, bouncing ideas off of each other. Jesus gives an idea and they're like, ah, I got I think I got a better idea. Hey, but what about this? It's ridiculous, isn't it? Do you know what there was? There was a church. Jesus said there was a church. If they neglect the area, you take it to the church. Do you know who the shepherd was? There was a pastor. There was a man. A man. Jesus was a man. Hey, he was fully God, but he was really a man that stepped into play. And you know what happened? He's like a judge. He's like a deliverer. Do you know who he's meant to be? He's meant to be the sheep of the shepherd. He's meant to be that bishop is what he was meant to be. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 25. 
It says this, For you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishops. And bishop, I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that's the other version of, of the, the other church structure. And bishop of your souls, right? And bishop of your souls. The shepherd and bishop of your souls. So how many was there? When Jesus was on this earth of that church, what did they have? They had one boss at the top. He was, a, he was truly a man, and he lived as a man. He was 100% and fully God, but he was fully man all at the same time. You know what he was? He was the bishop. Just like That's why Moses says that uh, the prophecy that God's like, hey, I'm going to raise up a prophet like unto, you, like unto him. What is it? There's going to be ways in which they're the same. He's, he was a man that was over the congregation. That's what it was. He was a man that was shut up, and he is the, he's the shepherd, and he's the bishop of our souls, isn't he? He's the he was the shepherd and bishop of the church in the New Testament. Now, I don't have any New Testament scriptures that we're going to go over. You can, you can look up the word bishop. You can look up the word bishops over and over again. But this is what I want to tell you. This is what's extremely interesting. You're never given specifics on the church structure in the New Testament. Do you know why? Because you're told it very clearly all throughout the Bible. Because the church didn't start in the book of Acts. Let that set in. You know what there's mentioned sometimes? There's mentioned uh, 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 bishops of churches. You know what, we know what, what's bishop mean? Think about this. It's as clear as day. It means rulers. Do you know what there were with Moses too? There were rulers. Rulers of 100s, rulers of 50s, rulers of 10s, rulers of 5s. But do you know what else there was? There was a man that was over the congregation. There was a, there was a Moses. There was a Joshua. The church did not begin in the New Testament. That's why you don't need all of these little specific details. Now, hey, there's qualifications that are given. There are clear qualifications that are given for a bishop. Yeah, there are details that are given to us in the New Testament. But as far as the authority structure, there is not a specific authority structure that's given in the New Testament. But there is a specific authority structure that we can clearly study out all throughout the Old Testament of what God desires for His congregation. It's not just over the nation of Israel. He says, set a man over the congregation. That is 100% equivalent with saying, set a man over the church. They mean the same thing in every single way. Set a man over the church. God sets a man over the church. You know what else he does after that? He sets another man, Othniel, over the church. You know what he does after that? Sets another man over the church. Keeps raising up one man at a time to be the ruler, to be the what? I don't want the sheep to go astray. I need a shepherd. I need a, I need a pastor. I need a bishop. I need, I need a boss here that's going to be ruling them. That's what I need. There, there, is, there is zero. Yeah, you can point me to places where it talks about bishops. I can point you to places in the Old Testament where it talks about rulers too. So if we compare the two, you're not proving anything, buddy. Nothing. You don't have... In the New Testament, that's where I'm saying, if, if you have it in your mind, well, I don't think this is very strong proof, then you have a dispensational lodge in your mind. We learn it from the Old Testament. The church does not begin in the New Testament. From beginning to end in the Bible, there is a man that is set over the congregation. The church did not start after Jesus left. The bishop, the pastor, he died, right? Rose again, went to heaven. He sends the apostles forth into all the earth, right? The authority structure that's, that's, that, that, that's talked about or given, you know, it talks about the apostles. Pat, so the apostles were not supposed to, meant, they were not meant to stay in one place. They were supposed to go out and start churches everywhere, right? That's what they were going to do. What type of system did they know of? What were they familiar with in their church? There was a bishop that was at the top, wasn't there? There was a boss that was at the top. So you know what they went out and they did? They went out and they ordained bishops. They went out and they ordained a man that was over the congregation. Hey, and if the church grows, hey, we need multiple bishops. We need multiple rulers. The, the New Testament does not say either way, but the Old Testament does. And the church was just as much there as it was in the New Testament. That's where people really lose it. That's where people really get confused. There is not a major disconnect. When Jesus showed up, he just became the bishop during that time of the congregation. The judge and the deliverer of the people. The spiritual deliverer and the judge of the church that was already in place. Right? And then there are bishops that are ordained after that. And... You know, uh, of, of all the different churches. There are all different types. So I'm going to go over a couple of the, um, of the uh, um, supposed objections that people were to bring up to this. Just a couple of quick objections. 
Number one, people will say the, the, uh, that you need, you need I'm going to give you two at least. I think I have two total, maybe three. Number one, people will say this. The people, you need to have this type of system where multiple people are preaching, and this is what they'll say. Uh, multiple people are preaching, and I'm not going to get on that particular subject. Multiple people are preaching because that keeps the pastor in check, or that keeps the, and they would even refer to him as the bishop in check. What does bishop mean? Ruler. So the people are keeping the ruler in check. I want you to run that through your mind a couple times. Were people keeping Moses in check? No. This is what, this is what people don't understand. You have to have the ruler keeping the people in check or they will be as sheep that have no shepherd. Did you hear what I said? That's what the Bible teaches. That is what the Bible teaches. It's the exact opposite. The job of the ruler or of the bishop is to keep... It, he's the ruler. He's the overseer. I mean, this sound, it's, you, are, you are literally reversing the, the, the meaning of the term. The, it's, this is not ran as the United States of America, my friend. That's not how it was designed and that's not how it was set up. The ruler keeps the people in check. He keeps the house of the Lord in check or they will be as sheep which have no shepherd. How'd that work out? Were the people keeping Joshua in check? Were the people keeping Moses in check? No, that's what happens. And when he dies, that's what... Here's the thing. When you find churches that have a strong leader and is following the word of the Lord... It, it works the same way present day today. If that man dies, you'll see a pattern where that church goes downhill quick. They start serving Baal. They start apostatizing right after, just like that. You know why? Because he was keeping them in check. That's what was going on. He was the one ruling the house of the Lord. And hey, these are the precepts that we are going to follow at the house of the Lord. Right? There was a chief, just like in the temple. There's a chief at the top. There's a chief of the chiefs. Hey, we might have other teachers that I'll bring in. You'll teach this class, that class. You'll teach you know, up here behind the pulpit. People will get other opportunities to preach. Hey, that's fine. Hey, we'll have other rulers. Hey, we have rulers right now out there soul winning. But guess what? Bring back the numbers to me. You want to go out soul winning? Go soul winning. You want to be a ruler even? Hey, I'll, I'll appoint you as one of the rulers of one of the soul winning times. But you are going to do things the way that I want them done. Because I'm the overseer of the church. I'm the man that's set over this congregation. According to the system of the New Testament, you know, pastors will ordain a pastor and he will go out and he will start a church. You want to use the word bishop, that's fine with me. They're, they're, a pastor is a bishop. I can show you so many times that they're used interchangeable. So, that's fine. You know, That's what happens. A pastor ordains a pastor, he goes out and he starts a church and he is the overseer. He is the bishop, he's the ruler. And, and, and it, it, it can be, you know... And I'm sorry to say this, but it's a very prideful mindset from, from the layman or the person that's sitting in the pew that thinks we need to keep that guy in check. Yeah. You're not keeping me in check, anyone in here. I'm keeping you in check. Amen. That's how it works. Right. That's how it works. That's what the Bible teaches. Amen. Amen. There's a bishop. There's a ruler. That's right. you know, this, is, this is just from beginning to end. Yeah, the Bible says bishops in the New Testament. Yeah, there were rulers over tens, fifties, and fives. You want to teach a Sunday cl school class or something like that? You know, we obviously don't have Sunday school. I'm being facetious. You want to be a leader over the soul winning time? That's fine. You know, but I'm the, I'm the man that's set over the congregation. We have rulers. There's rulers in all Baptist churches around here that actually have the right system too. You want to refer to them as a bishop? That's fine. Sometimes they even have multiple bishops, like pastors. But a system that is set up correctly, there is a head bishop. There is a chief bishop, if you will. Whatever word you want to use, there's a man that's set over the congregation. He can have his 70 elders, but guess what? He is the bishop of the church. This is so vital and so critical. It, it has nothing to do with a power trip. It has something to do with people going and whoring after other gods and, and, and all of the people backsliding and apostatizing. That's the type of system that you're designing if you don't set a man over the congregation. And you know what? Moses understood that, so you better too. Amen. You need to know the importance of having a strong leader. Someone that is willing to stand up and preach the word of God with power. That is willing to be a decision maker and say, this is what we're doing. When the problem arises, he says, hey, I'm resolving this. This is what we're going to do in this type of situation. These are, the, these are the steps that I'm going to take. This is what's going to happen. You know what that is? That's a ruler. That's a bishop. That's an overseer. It's his job to feed the flock. You know, everyone doesn't preach. Everyone doesn't preach. 
the shepherd feeds the sheep. Let's just have all the sheep come up here and preach. It, it, it just starts not making any sense at all. There's a shepherd because they're sheep. We're not all shepherds, right? There are certain people that are the flock, right? You know, Jesus was the shepherd of the sheep. He preached to his sheep. This is how it works. Hey, and sometimes, you know, uh, um, you, know you can have other preachers. There can be other people that, that, that preach and prophesy. Hey, that's perfectly fine. But there's still a bishop and there's still a ruler that decides who's preaching and who's not. And, he, and you know what his job is? To feed the sheep. He's the one feeding the sheep. Hey, sometimes the sheep can step up and they can learn to preach and they can preach sometimes and preach good messages. But there's still a shepherd. There's still, everyone's not a shepherd. It's not a room filled with all the shepherd just feeding all of the shepherds. Right? The shepherds are feeding all of the shepherds. That's what you have. Everyone's not a preacher. That's just, do all prophesy? That's what the Bible says. Do all prophesy? Answer the rhetorical question for yourself, my friend. Do all prophesy? No. You have to be apt to teach. If you allow someone to... What's the purpose of... For, in order to be a bishop, right? There's a reason why you have to be apt to teach. You know why? Because you're the primary preacher and teacher of the church. That's your job as a shepherd to feed the flock. This is very important. People that disagree with me, I don't hate them. You know, but they, that is, it's, it's, it's disastrous. You, you will destroy a church. You will destroy people if you build up a, you know, a group of people and there's no shepherd and there's no one guiding the flock that's, that's you know, qualified. There needs to be a man that's set over the congregation. The churches out there that have a bunch of deacons making the decisions, those churches will fail too. They will. They will. They'll fail too. Because you need... Here's the thing. Very often you look at pastors, people that desire the office of a bishop, people that be, want to become a pastor, they, are, they, they should be. And, and the ones that are ordained and that are qualified and sent out, they're spiritually mature. They are hungry for the Word of God. They read the Word of God all the time. They're always trying to find new things. This is just, just a pattern of, 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 of pastors. They need to be spiritually grown. It's not just anyone and everyone can be a pastor. There needs to be a marker that we need to set here for qualifications. It's not just for anyone and everyone. So you, that, what you need is, this is my point, there needs to be a leader that has met those marks, that steps up and is able to lead the people. That is the point. There needs to be, and you know what we need? We need men to rise up and say, hey, I want to be a bishop like that. You know, if any man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Hey, it's good to want to be a pastor. But you need to understand, too, this is what comes with that. You are a man that's set over the congregation. That's a lot of responsibility. That is a lot of responsibility. You have to feed the flock. You have to protect the flock against wolves. You have to preach doctrine when it needs to be preached. You have to you know, teach the Bible. Uh, uh, you have to be apt to teach. You have to be a good ruler. You have to be strong. You have to be able to say no when you need to say no to friends or whoever it may be. You have to have you know, uh, uh, boundaries and things that are going to happen and you need to you know, put your foot down when you need to put your foot down. So when you understand, hey, that it, there's a man that's set over the congregation, that's obviously a lot more weight that's put on his shoulders. Shoulders, Just like Moses is like, hey, this is heavy. It is heavy. You know, especially the larger the church gets, the more people that you're having to pastor and, and, and all of that. I can't imagine doing it to an entire nation. But that's what God wanted Moses to do. That's what he had set up. He had his uh, rulers underneath of him, but he wanted him to be a man set over the congregation. That just shows how much more important it is that you need to be ready when it's time to be a bishop. We need real bishops to go out there and, and be pastors of congregations. That's what we need. And to rule and to be a ruler. And to be a bishop and to be an overseer and to be a shepherd and feed the flock. And set up the right systems. The right systems of a congregation because that's how you can feed a flock and that's how you can help people to grow spiritually. There has to be a strong leader there. People will just go astray and they'll fail. It's just what the Bible teaches. That is, that is clearly what the Bible teaches. That's what we need. Now, uh, the other one I want to answer real quick is this. Two things. Real super fast, these last ones. What, what about the susceptibility of, of pride if you have a pastor? right? People say, well, what about you know, he's more susceptible to pride? That, that is, a, that is a, 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 a moot point because that's the, this is the system. What about the judges? Were they more susceptible to pride? I don't have to answer your question is my point. 
What about Moses? He was a man set over the congregation. What about Joshua? He was a man set over the congregation. Were they more susceptible to pride? Hey, that may be a possibility if you say. That just means you need to guard yourself even more so. That doesn't mean anything. Hey, they become more susceptible to pride. That doesn't, that doesn't disprove the system that God set up. That, you know, when somebody says to me, hey, you're more susceptible to pride, I'm just going to say, set a man over the congregation. Set a man over the congregation. Man. That's what I'm going to say. You know what Moses thought? Moses thought there needed to be a man set over the congregation. Now, if you think that that makes Joshua more susceptible to pride, well, take it up with God and take it up with Moses. God raised the judge and the deliverer. God did that. That's what God did. God chose Moses and he said, hey, you're going to be the boss. And then after Moses inquired because, hey, this is too heavy for me, he said, hey, I'll give you other rulers that can be under you. But they answered to him. They answered to him. Was Moses more... Was it possible that he was more susceptible to pride? That's the system. What does it matter? Maybe, if, if, if so, if, if it is possible, which it, it probably is, of course it's more possible. Because you know, with that, you need to make sure that you keep your check in self, yourself in check even more so. That's what you need to do. You need to be very careful. That's what you need to do. If you become a bishop or become a pastor or become a ruler, you need to be a humble leader. That's what you need to do. You need to look at Moses and be a humble leader like Moses was. Look at Joshua and try to be a humble leader like Joshua was. Hey, how are, how are families designed? There's a head. My wife, I don't sit down with my wife and we don't like hash out things like that if there's a big decision that needs to be made. I'm going to be 100% honest with you. That's how our household works entirely. If there's a huge decision to be made, you know, I may ask my wife a couple of things. Like, I entirely make the decision, 100%. Some, there's many times where I don't even ask her. Just because I'm the lead. I'm not ruling selfishly. I ask my wife how I make decisions. Most of the decisions I make are honestly 100% for my family. I'm the one that's always like, yeah, I'll just give you a small example. When we're going out to eat somewhere, I always go where they want to go. Like, literally every single time. Every time. I, and a lot of times my wife was like, no, 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 wherever you want to go, I want to go where you want to go, I want to go where you want to go. And then we ask the kids and, you know, it ends up being a mess back and forth. But every time I try my hardest to go where they want to go. When I'm ruling and I'm making decisions for my family, a lot of times if I have to make a big decision, I don't even ask her. Because I'm the boss. Now I do sometimes, I feel like maybe she has some insight on something. There's nothing wrong with that. What do you think about this? You know, you know, what do you, you know, whatever it may be. But I'm going to be honest with you, probably 85, 90% of the time, I just make the decisions. I do. But I don't make the decisions for myself. I make them for my family. I put them first. I get the short end of the stick. How often? Tell the truth. All the time. That stupid shed, I put it back there for her. Because she wanted all that stuff out of the utility room. I literally was up till like 3 o'clock in the morning like four days in a row. Not for me. I don't care that much about walking in there and seeing that stuff in there. She cared. She wanted that stuff out of there. That pool, I'll probably never get in in my life. I don't like pools that much. I got that thing and did all the work for it for them. That was the reason why I wanted it. That chicken coop. I brought the idea up, and then she was ecstatic about it. And, and I wouldn't have went through with it and got it if she wouldn't have wanted it. The decisions that I make in my family are, would you agree with that? Am I blowing smoke? Most of the time are they for you and the kids are not. Yes, they are, she said. Most of the time, the decisions that I make are for them. I'll do what they want to do. Because I try to really follow what the Bible tells you to do as a leader. The decisions of the church, I try to make what's best for this church. I don't just try to see what can I get out of this, what can I get out of that. What can I do this? When I think of what sermons I'm going to preach, I think, what, what sermons have I not preached on? What sermons do they need? The, that's what, my point is this. You want to try to, you want to make sure that, hey... You're not susceptible to pride if you want to be a bishop or you are a bishop. You know what you need to do? You need to make sure that you get the attention off of yourself and put the attention on the sheep. You need to try to put the attention on them. I try to preach sermons that, that not to tickle your ears. You know, I don't want to, I'm not going to stand up here and entertain you every time that I preach. I'm going to be 100% honest with you. you know, sometimes you may expect me to preach a certain style of sermon all the time. 
You know, I'm not going to stand up here and, and be like Anderson every time I preach. Seriously, where I'm going to entertain you. You'll notice that the, some of the style sermons that I preach are not the same as like that group. That's because my job is not to entertain you. You may feel like you want to be entertained a lot. I understand that. It's sitting in the, the pew. It's different for you. But I preach sermons that are practical. And I think, what have I not preached on and what is, what is a good value that I haven't touched on or what is a good principle for the people that are in my congregation? I'm not just standing up here and yelling every service where I'm ripping and screaming just because it makes you feel good. I'm not, that, it's a, that's a different style of tickling your ears really is what it is. That's not what I'm interested in doing. I'm up here and if you get bored too bad because what I'm doing is I'm trying to preach a sermon to help you. I'm trying to preach on subjects that will benefit you in your Christianity. Amen. That's my job. Amen. And I'm, I'm not, I don't preach, I, I, I can tell you this. When I write sermons, I never think, what do I feel like preaching about? What is my deciding factor is I start thinking, what have I not preached about? What's something maybe that I haven't hit on in a while? What would be good for my congregation? Every time. Amen. Every single time. Every time that I write a sermon. Every time. That is my job. So you say, are they more susceptible to pride? Was Moses? Was Joshua? That's God's system. That's a moot point. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you think that the more... Hey, yes, they're more susceptible to pride. But God set that system up. Right. Any more questions? Set a man over the congregation. Any more questions? Man. There needs to be a man over the congregation. Hey, there are bishops, there are deacons listed here. Yeah, there were rulers in the Old Testament. There were rulers in the Old Testament, but there was a man that was set over the church. There was a pastor that was set over the church. You can never point me to one single example. One example where the Bible says you need to have multiple bishops, there needs to be multiple people with the same authority. Never. Every, listen to me, every single, every single, listen to this last statement very clearly. Every single system in the Bible, listen very carefully, every single system in the Bible where we are given specific details about the authority structure, there's always a man that's set over it. Let that sit in. Every time where we're given the specific details, there's a man that's set over something. There's a chief of that system. There's a head of the congregation. You know why? Because they'll be a sheep not having a shepherd. That's what the Bible teaches. And this is something I've never heard articulated a lot. That's why I wanted to preach about it. It's something that so many people are confused about. And they have these quacky, crazy ideas from so many different angles. Some of them are very good people. But this is what the Bible teaches. You need a man that's set over the congregation. There needs to be a bishop. There needs to be a shepherd. There needs to be a pastor. And then the other one, I, I just out dealt with it just a moment ago. Can you have multiple bishops? Yes. You have a Moses and then you have 70 elders. That's perfectly fine with me. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word.